All right. That's a whole lot of stuff. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Thank you for your giving. Thank you for uh, all that's happened already this morning. Um, We could leave right now and we would be good. Um, But I want you to hear at least one story today and maybe two. If you are visiting, then you don't know that we're in the middle of a series on the gifts of the Spirit. And we have already looked at Word of Wisdom, which is the practical application of something the Lord is asking you to do. It's an instant insight that shows how a given situation or need is to be resolved, helped, or healed. We've looked at Word of Knowledge, which is a supernatural revelation of information pertaining to a person or an event given for a specific purpose, usually having to do with an immediate need. It's important to note that this is not learned knowledge from book or experience. It's from the Lord. We've looked at faith, which is uh, the gift of faith has the ability to discern with extraordinary confidence the will and purposes of God for the future of his work. Robert Heidler says, when you operate in the gift of faith, you know what God desires and you're supremely confident that no matter how negative the circumstances, God will make it possible. And then last week we looked at healing. Healing would be described as a healing that God performs supernaturally. It's important to notice that the words gift and healing there in Scripture in the Greek are plural. Plural implies healing of multiple sicknesses, diseases, and disorders. Meaning, uh, oftentimes when we pray for healing, it's a physical healing. That's what we tend to focus on. But the gift of healing is emotional. The gift of healing is spiritual. The gift of healing is addiction. The gift of healing is physical. And so last week at the conclusion of service, we heard um, Crystal share a testimony about a healing of emotions from fear. We heard my father share a testimony about healing from addiction. We heard Tim and Isabel share a testimony about their daughter being healed from uh, food disorders, physical. Uh, and, and many of you have shared testimonies with me since then and before about how the Lord has healed physically. One of the purposes of this series is for you to see the gifts are still active today. They are not dead. They are not dormant. They are still active today, and the Lord is still moving mightily through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit are for giving God glory, pointing people to Jesus, accomplishing the will and purposes of the Lord and according to 1 Corinthians 12, 7, for the profit of all. So today we're going to look at miracles and if there's time, prophecy, but we're probably not going to get to prophecy. Sorry, Andy. Sorry, Dad. We just, I'm looking at the clock. It's probably not going to happen. Uh, but we will get to prophecy eventually if we don't get there today. So what's a miracle? A miracle is a manifestation of power beyond the ordinary course of natural law. It is a divine enablement to do something that could not be done naturally. R.M. Riggs describes a miracle as an orderly intervention in the regular operations of nature. Here's how I would say it. It's basically an undeniable intervention from the Lord. It's not you or I accomplishing the feat, but rather the Holy Spirit helping us to do something we couldn't have done on our own. Think old lady who picks up the car that's sitting on the kid, right? Like it's not ever going to happen in the natural realm, but all of a sudden she has supernatural. That's, that is the Holy Spirit. That's a miracle. Something that doesn't make sense in the natural. It, it removes the natural boundaries and limitations that we have in this life. And the Holy Spirit comes in and does something different. Um, we have endeavored to give you a biblical example um, In each of these gifts, uh, there are two biblical examples. I'm only going to, I mean, there's multiple biblical examples. One is the feeding of the 5,000. And I considered reading that this morning simply because that is the only miracle that's actually in all four Gospels um, that Jesus performed. I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, But in in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 is shared. What is that miracle? Jesus says, we're going to feed everybody because they're hungry. At least 5,000 people. It's called the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus says to the disciples, what do we have? And the disciples say, nothing. And Jesus says, well, go find me something. And they go and they find uh, two fish and five loaves of bread, right? That's how this goes. Jesus says, okay, that's enough to feed 5,000 people. And the disciples, uh, I think, checked his temperature at that moment. 
uh, asked him if he was dehydrated, uh, said, are you really all here? I'm, I'm, obviously, that, that did not actually happen according to Scripture. I think it could have happened in the natural. Jesus says, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to bless it, bless it, and we're going to break the bread, and we're going to pass it out. And if you read the passage of Scripture, it says they ate till they were full. It doesn't say everybody got some and it was enough. It says they ate till they were full. These people hadn't eaten in a long time. They were hungry. And that those two fish and those five loaves of bread, uh, talk about a miracle. And lives were changed forever. That's a miracle. Uh, but I want to read to you, actually, the story of Paul and Silas. Uh, because I told you last week, you dismiss Jesus' miracles because it's Jesus. You, you don't count those as acts of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because you're like, well, that was just Jesus, and Jesus can do anything. Well, yes, Jesus can do anything, but so can you. But, but for the sake of sharing a biblical example that's not Jesus, listen to what it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Sounds like this morning. Tired of walking around these walls? Tired of being in chains? What, did, what are they doing? They were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. They had an audience. I'm not sure if you've ever noticed that before. It doesn't say they were singing with them. That'll be important in a second. It says they were there. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed, even those who weren't worshiping. Your worship has power and authority. It doesn't affect just you. It affects those around you. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Here, here, here. And he called for a light and he ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. That's a miracle. They're in prison for preaching the gospel. That's all they did. They're just doing miracles. They're seeing people healed. They're preaching the gospel. And there are people who don't like that. And so they complain. They stir up these riots. Paul and Silas get taken to prison. And what do they do? They get into their pity party like I do. They sit down and they start pouting and whining and saying, Why me? All I was doing was preaching the gospel. I just don't understand. I'm giving my life to serve you. Do you know all of the bad things that have happened to me? Do you know I've been beaten? Do you know I've been stoned? Hello? You know I was stoned, right? Like, do you, you know that, right? You know that I was, uh, or it hadn't happened yet, but you know I'm going to be shipwrecked one day, <laughs> floating around in the water. I, that's not what they did, but that's what we do. It's what I do. Complete honesty and transparency. That hour and a half, the five and a half miles around my island, it started with whining and complaining. <laughs> it did. I was whining and complaining. I was awake at 5.30. I was whining and complaining that I needed to be whining and complaining. Just, I, come on, you, you do the same thing. Don't be so super spiritual that you lie to me about it. That's not what they did, though. Now, I know enough Bible, I've had enough experience walking with the Lord that I get out of it, right? I, I, I come to worship sometimes and fake it till I make it, just like you do. If they don't play the right song, it ain't going to happen today. You better hope you heard from the Holy Spirit, bucko. <laughs> Let me give you a hint. No. You do this. I know you do this. Paul and Silas, in the midst of being chained up, they're worshiping. 
and they're worshiping while everybody else is listening. Now, I don't know if they complained because Paul and Silas probably couldn't sing. I mean, that's a gift. Not everybody has. I don't have it. That's why I turn my mic off when I sing. Paul and Silas, in the midst of their singing, because it doesn't say what they're singing. They're, they're singing probably psalms. They're singing so- songs that have been written from their Jewish history. Right? I can see them singing uh, the song that um, was it Miriam wrote after they left Egypt, after the uh, uh, after they got uh, rescued and, and and left from Egypt, and, and Miriam writes that song, and they get across the, the Red Sea, right? Like that would I could see them singing that song. I can see them singing songs that David wrote, like they weren't singing Amazing Grace, in case anybody's wondering, it wasn't written yet. They weren't singing Do It Again, Lord. It was going to be all Bible. It was going to be all word of God. I don't know if the other prisoners were offended. I don't know if they were annoyed. We're trying to go to sleep. Don't you know it's midnight? But their worship freed everybody. Your worship frees your family. Mom and dad, grandma, grandpa. By the way, if you don't have a praying grandma, I'm sorry. I really am sorry, because praying grandmas change things. And if, if you don't have a praying grandma, then when it becomes time, you better be a praying grandma. Sorry, grandpa, you matter too, but not as much as grandma. I don't know what it is. There is something about a praying grandmother. I don't know how this all went down, but what I know is their worship and their prayer didn't just rescue them from prison, it physically saved the, the guard's life. It physically, I'm sorry, spiritually rescued them to a place of salvation, him and his family. A miracle, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, when the gifts move, it's to point people to the Lord. It's to point people to Jesus. It's to accomplish his purposes. Why haven't miracles happened in your life? Well, I would ask, is it for his glory or for your glory? If it's for your glory, it's probably not going to happen. But if it's for his glory, if it's for his purposes, it changes things. Uh, I think a a practical uh, today, so we we do a biblical example, then we do a today example. I think the first one I'm going to give is this. Um, Every conception, pregnancy, and birth is a miracle. And you may not acknowledge that because it happens every single day. And maybe you are a doctor or a nurse and you happen to be in hospitals where you hear the the sound, you know, every five seconds, every five minutes of a baby being born. It's a miracle. You, your act to conception is only pleasurable. Everything else is God. Uh, It's not you. And if you've had problems getting pregnant and then you get pregnant, you value that miracle more than somebody who hasn't. And you have a different understanding of the reality that this is indeed a miracle. And I want to say that this morning because I think too often what comes becomes complacent and common gets lost. And yet that is a miracle from the Lord that happens every single time. And don't ever lose sight of that. The other miracle I want to share this morning is uh, actually having uh, Matthew and Rhonda. Would you guys come up? Um, I want them to share what is a miracle. And uh, it's also healing. It's also faith. There's a whole lot that's wrapped up in it. By the way, most of the encounters when we share about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of gifts, they encompass multiple gifts. It's not typically just one. If If you are healed, faith was involved. Right? Like the gift of faith is also involved. Sometimes a word of knowledge is also involved. Uh, in this one, there's faith, there's healing, there's, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. So who am I giving this to first? And I think they were able to get those pictures if you want them. Um, 
God's shown himself real in mine and my wife's life, you know, over the 27 years we've been married in a lot of different ways. But uh, one of the biggest ways was before we even had any of our kids. Back in 95, I was working for a medical supply company where m one of my jobs was delivering liquid oxygen to nursing homes and individual residents and so forth. And I had gotten a call uh, to make a, a quick delivery that I'd never been to before. And the accounts that I'm sharing with you, I don't know really firsthand in the sense that I had a close head injury due to the accident to where a lot of it was just had to be relayed to me and through the facts that they had from the police report and the scene and, and then everything that happened in the hospital. You know, I've been able to put it together. But as you can see, that was the liquid, o liquid oxygen truck that I was driving. It was a box van to where the cab of the truck sat on top of the engine, so there was really no nose to the front of the truck. And supposedly, as I was going over this hill in um, South Dallas and Cockrell Hill and trying to read a map, you know, as I was going, because I didn't know where I was going, as I was going over the hill, evidently, the guy that I hit, he was at a stoplight, and he noticed that I was evidently going to be going way too fast to be able to, to, for him to get out of the way. So he actually just jumped out of his truck. And I had probably three to 400 pounds of liquid oxygen in my truck, and I hit a butane truck. And liquid oxygen and any petroleum product don't have a good reaction when they mix together. Fortunately, I had prepared my truck to where I was meeting all the hazmat requirements and so did had he. So there was no breaches in any of the tanks. But it took three different jaws of life to get me out of the cab of the truck because I was so pinned in. And now my wife wants to share. <laughs> so I, th I think from this point it might help just for me to give a little uh, c context. I'm going to do the best I can because I'm not really a good sharer. I'm a good joker, but that's about it. So um, Matthew was working, as he said, for a medical supply company, and they were a large company. And so someone was able to see the number on the side of the van and called the company to let them know one of their drivers had been in a real serious car accident. Um, and they immediately turned on all of the, apparently they had access to like the paramedic scanners and everything so they could kind of hear what was going on. And um, uh, at the scene, uh, Matthew wasn't breathing, he didn't have a pulse, so they called him dead on arrival. And they just left him in his van. And um, there was a guy that had been recently saved, he had had a dramatic conversion, and he you know, didn't know that you don't call out to the Lord for a miracle. I mean, he really wasn't limited by, unfortunately, church experience. And um, they started calling out to all of their drivers, and Matthew didn't answer. And Andrew just felt like the Lord quickened in his heart to call life and started just crying out to the Lord, Matthew, wake up. Matthew, you know, speak. And they had lots of paramedics there. They were trying to control the area, um, shut, you know, shut down the location. And, um, and I, it was about 20 minutes and about the time that Andrew found out and was just really praying and believing for Matthew that they heard him make a sound. And so they went over to the truck and um, started working on him. They had to call in another Jaws of Life from another um, city. And he was, um, because the company was kind of listening to what was happening, they had um, uh, called him in as an amputee at the scene because they couldn't free his left arm and it was already pretty badly damaged. And so they called him into Parkland as an amputee. And I understand one of the other paramedics said, He's okay, he's stable, and so we're gonna work a little bit harder. They freed his left arm and decided to make a change and send him down to Baylor in um, Dallas because they had a better brain trauma center. Are you wanting the mic back? <laughs> <laughs> so I was a little hard to get a hold of that day. Uh, my dad and I went down to the, to the hospital because they had finally called me and they said they, they're putting Matt in a helicopter and they're flying him to, to uh, Dallas. And, um, you know, I asked, is he alive? And they just said, we really don't know. And so when we got to the hospital, um, I went to the restroom. And, you know, I, you don't really have a concept of what a bad wreck is if you haven't really been through one. 
And so I went to the restroom and I went up to the front and I was like, hey, I just thought I'd let, you know, front desk know I was there. And they said, we've got a private room for your family. There's already people gathering, chaplains there. And I was like, wow, that doesn't really sound real good. Um, <laughs> so um, after a little bit, they let my dad and I go see Matt. And he was, you know, already the brain swelling and everything. He was kind of starting into a coma at that point. But I remember going back to ER and they had his left hand like totally wrapped up and he was kind of trying to respond and he just real quickly um, the injuries that I had is I had a compound fracture in my left wrist it's where you know the bones break through and it and the steering wheel basically it kind of collapsed on itself because I could have held it too hard I crushed most of the bones in my right foot you know between the base of my toes all the way up to my ankle and so I had metal all put in there and then I also fractured my left femur um, and dislocated my uh, knee as well so I have to make more constant type to work to go back to shape. So he had actually broken every bone in his body from his hips down on one side or the other or both and they had a little problem recovering his knees and his right arm or left arm was all messed up and things so Anyway, when I got back to ER, he kind of started to move his hand, and the, and the nurse rushed over real quick and said, don't move that hand or it's going to fall off on the floor. It, it, was, it was that bad. So um, anyway, we got back into the room with the family, and a surgeon came in, and he said, um, uh, I don't do too many of these um, because I'm really good, and they don't usually call me. And I thought, wow, that's really conceited of him to say that. But, you know, if you kind of reinterpret that through the Lord, he was saying, you are really blessed that I am here. He's, he's, guy, he's a guy who does, like, he goes with the Professional Bull Riding Association and kind of repairs those guys. Um, he's often out on the arena floor. We still see him on TV. But he said, all I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to work on his knees, and I've got to stabilize his, his femur, and I'm going to do the best I can with his hand and foot, and then the, we're going to bring in other specialists to come and work on, on Matt. So anyway, it, it, was, it was a long journey, and like his first surgery, I was expecting him to look a little bit better, but there was just lots of pins and lots of scaffolding trying to hold him in place, and they had like, we just happened to have the best foot surgeon in the nation in Dallas, and because uh, they didn't know if they were going to save his right foot. Um, they had to do a lot of opening up just to even get good blood supply to it. And it was kind of a different journey. You know, our friends were buying houses, having babies, taking trips. And we were, <laughs> like, hanging out in the hospital and spent the next couple of years, um, um, you know, multiple surgeries. And, and, you know, I got to drive a wheelchair for a long time with him in it. Um, so, and God even kind of prepared us for, uh, for that season, even though we didn't know. He kind of called us to get out of debt, so we paid off all of our student loans, paid off our car. Um, then I wanted to buy a car because we'd shared one for like three or four years, and I bought it from a friend whose daughter was a quadriplegic, and she bought it specifically for a wheelchair, and it was the best station wagon. Don't ask me why I was enamored with station wagons at the time, but was just God kind of always preparing us and um, just getting us ready for that that season in our lives. And um, I was just really thankful for that. And um, even his last surgery was just like a few months before our first child was born, before Levi was born. And it was, it, it just really blessed my heart that the Lord finally had him out of his cast like the week before our son was born so that he could stand up next to me during a birth. You know, it seems like a small thing, but that was really important to me and something that was heavy on my heart. And this might be the only time that I cry during this whole thing, and I'll give the, the mic back to Matt in a minute, but, you know, we're not really very special. Everybody has miracles. Everybody has, has you know, whether you recognize it or not, in the big and the small. Um, but we're just average Joes. There's nothing really special about us or anything fancy or exciting that we do but we did after all of this we felt very called to foster ministry and I know that God per preserved uh, us in our marriage because we were supposed to be Santana and Starla and Judah's mom you guys were going to go into foster care and God saved your dad so that we could be the family that we were supposed to be and that we were going to be there for you so Yeah, 
was I was in the hospital for over a month, uh, you know, just in recovery and rehab, and you know, you don't know why things happen the way they do, and I still have some, you know, some lingering effects that have changed the way I do things that wouldn't have happened, you know, before the accident, but I just kind of reminds me of God's, you know, faithfulness and that I'm here to have a sore foot or I'm here to maybe not be able to do certain things that I used to do. And I'm just, I'm thankful that, that God, you know, saw after me as Rana was saying that, you know, they had left me for dead, but yet, um, you know, they wanted to contain any possible explosions. And then when Andrew, you know, said, wake them up, God, you know, that's when they heard me moan. And, you know, God works in the ways that he does for reasons that he does. And, you know, he's, you know, as Rhonda was saying, we're, we didn't, weren't doing anything extra special to warrant such favor. It's God's favor. And he did it because he loves us, and we're sharing it with you to bring glory to him, not to us. It's nothing we asked for or deserved. It's He did it because of out of his love and compassion for us. And there's probably a lot more we could share, but, you know, I'm just thankful that God's hand was on us because I shouldn't have made it through it. And that's when I should have had cued the Al Michaels, Do You Believe in Miracles? <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, miracles still happen today. I, I asked Matthew and Rhonda to share. I mean, it's dramatic, obviously. Um, but as they said, they weren't like worldwide evangelists that were winning thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. So they're the ones that needed a miracle, right? They're sitting there where they always sit every week, just like you're sitting where you sit every week, and you are just as worthy of miracles as they are. But why did the Lord do it? What, what is the, for his glory, to point people to Jesus? so that they can accomplish the purposes that the Lord had in their life. And I couldn't have said it any better. You are here, Matthew, to be the father of Levi and Santana and Judah and Starla. I'm looking for you. I knew I, I saw him look over here, so I knew one of you were sitting over here. And Starla. They're, they're, they're leading their family. That's their ministry. They are sharing their testimony. That's their ministry. Rhonda has... She fought me to come on to the council. But you are leading, and that is part of your ministry. By the way, we brought her on because she's a joker. Um, so why we do a definition, we do a biblical example, we do a today example, and then what does it look like today? It looks like for his glory, to accomplish his purposes. There's nothing else for me to say. I can keep talking for the sake of continuing to talk, but there's no reason for me to continue to talk. What I need to tell you is this. If you need a miracle, I happen to know the guy who provides them. That's it. That's it. So I'm going to pray for you, and we're done. We're going to go home. If you need a miracle, don't leave here without having somebody pray for you. You cannot come to a place like this and experienced what you've experienced today through worship and through the prophetic word that came forth during worship, through the testimonies that you've heard and the truth that the spirit is alive and active and then leave here knowing you have a need without at least taking it to the Lord. He, he maybe still hasn't failed you yet. Don't leave here without having somebody pray for you. And so I'm going to pray if uh, any of the elders or council or staff or anybody who feels qualified wants to pray, look, Jesus hears you just like he hears me. Uh, if you're willing to stick around for a minute and pray with people, uh, we'll, we'll come up here and we'll wait and we'll pray with anybody who needs prayer. Uh, but that's it. Lord, 
You are the miracle worker. And you still do miracles today. And for that, I am grateful. Lord, thank you for saving Matthew's life. Thank you for having Andrew be a man of faith in that moment. Thank you for Santana and Judah and Starla and Levi. Thank you for the example that uh, Rhonda and Matthew's marriage is. Thank you for the example that they are in loving um, those that you entrust to them. Thank you for his healing. Thank you for their faith. And thank you that you still are moving today. God, I am so grateful that I don't have to do this on my own. Because it's way too hard. But with you and your Holy Spirit empowering, Lord, we can really do anything that points people to you, that glorifies you, that is part of your purpose and your will and for others, Lord. I believe we can do anything. And so with that, Father, I ask that you would bless those who are here, those that are watching or will be watching. God, I ask that they would have an incredible week. Lord, those that are going to camp, I pray that they would have uh, an experience this week like they've never had before. Lord, many of us have been to camp uh, more times than we can count. And so we think we know everything that's going to happen. And yet, Lord, I believe you have something even better in store. And so help us to lay down our prejudices and our commonality of what we think it will look like and to be ready for all that you have. Lord, protect every single driver that will be driving to camp. Lord, we've lost people on the way to camp before. Protect our drivers, keep them alert, and not just from our church, from all of the churches that will be traveling this week. Let us have an encounter with you and bring us all home safely, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that you are faithful. My tears are tears of joy and celebration because of your faithfulness, Lord. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, it's not as bad as it feels, I promise. Have a great week, everybody. And if you need a miracle, we are going to pray with you. Don't leave if you need a miracle.